Okay, so today is April 8, 2016. So let us ask our Heavenly Family for blessings. Heavenly Family, thank you so, so very much for helping us to understand the truth. Thank you for guiding us in um, learning the ways of righteousness. And thank you for instilling within this message right principles for us all to grasp a hold of and allow you to instill them in ourselves. So please accomplish that purpose tonight, Heavenly Family. Guide our discussion. If there's anyone else who should be here, please bring them here, Heavenly Family, and uh, fill all of our homes with the atmosphere of heaven. Guide us to put aside any uh, worldly thoughts, any thoughts of discouragement, anything that could uh, prevent us from gaining the full blessing of what you want to give us tonight. So help us to understand the truth and bring this meeting to be just what you want it to be, Heavenly Family. Let your love reign and your truth reign and help us to really take the message to heart. Thank you so much. Father and Mother, we ask these things, B'Shem Zemach, in the name of Branch. Amen. Amen. Okay, so, um, there's always so many things to discuss. <laughs> always so many different aspects of truth. But we're going to be, most likely, unless our Heavenly Family takes us in another direction, um, continuing on in our investigation of the community rule, it's been so full of so full of good discussion, or I'll say so many elements within it instigate excellent discussion. So we can talk about that and uh, continue on in the community rule. But also, if anyone had any comments or questions on the Dead Sea Scrolls in general, the Qumran community, and also to go a little bit more broadly, um, the beginnings of the Nazarene movement and the Nazarene movement and the, you know, the historical Jesus, the historical followers of Jesus, and their own setting, you know, the, the broader setting of the Nazarene movement. That's all very, very important. And the community rule and the rest of the documents found in the Dead Sea Scrolls play a part in showing us that context. Um, to go even broader than that, if anyone has questions on the present message in general, please feel free to ask them. Um, but again, just to have some order to our discussion, if anyone has questions on the message in general first, then I think that's a good way to do it, to address those things first. And then after that, we can narrow in a little bit more to the Dead Sea Scrolls and to the things related to that. And then, depending on how much time we have, we can come in closer to the community rule itself. So if anyone has any questions on the message overall first, uh, now is the time to ask. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments on the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, the history of the Qumran community, or how it relates to the New Testament, or anything like that? Um, before getting into the community rule?
Well, I suppose not. All right, well. I had a question a on the mes- message itself, but i got to find out where I wrote it down. Okay, sure. <laughs> And I probably won't find it right away, so don't wait for me. Um, hey, did you see the bulletin board? <laughs> all right. I got a little notebook that I put things in, but I got so much stuff in there, it right. can get lost in there. Well, while we were looking for that, um, I was thinking today in anticipation of the double Sabbath, um, if we could take a moment, if you could explain if there's anything in particular on a double Sabbath that we should be doing differently. Um, Because I was realizing I really didn't know what that meant other than it's extra special. Sure. Now, that's actually a really excellent question. Um, And first I'll mention kind of something about the seventh-day Sabbath and then the idea of a high Sabbath or double Sabbath. or double Sabbath can be even considered more than a high Sabbath, actually. So first, you have just the regular Seventh-day Sabbath itself, which sometimes people speak of the double blessing of the Sabbath. And that's kind of taken from the sacrificial system, how there were special sacrifices for the Seventh-day Sabbath, but what it was, it was just a doubling of the daily sacrifices. So you have each... You know, every day you have the sacrifices, uh, the morning and evening sacrifice, and the Sabbath has those same sacrifices, and it has those same ones doubled. So you have double sacrifice on the Sabbath, but it's the same sacrifices. Are they done at the same time? Yeah, they're done like at the same basic Two time. sacrifices at the morning yeah. hour instead of one, and two at the evening instead of one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's basically... Just doubling the sacrifices, doing them at the same general point of time. Obviously, it will take however much longer to do the second sacrifice. Um, but so that's, so far as we know, um, it, they don't specify the time that much. Uh, in At least in Leviticus, it doesn't specify, or actually, no, it's, it's in uh, Numbers where it says this. So times for all the sacrifices during the feast days and so on are not uh, specified with exactness, but they uh, are put at the time of sacrifice. Um, now, so that's that's the seventh day Sabbath. That there's a double blessing there itself. How exactly that plays out in the antitypical observance, I don't know yet. In fact, even all the elements of the daily sacrifice. There are certain elements of it that, okay, well, we don't know specifically what it means and how to go about participating in that. So we know that there is a, uh, either a lamb or a he goat, I think it could be one or the other, that is offered each day, lamb of the first year, one in the morning, one in the evening. There's a corresponding grain offering that is offered with it, that has oil. There's a corresponding drink offering as well. Um, And then there's the frankincense. So you have these different elements. And okay, well, in the antitype, how all does it come together? What is the specific antitype of the grain offering versus the burnt offering itself, the animal, versus the drink offering? And then the incense, and you know, you have these all these different elements. Um, for some of them, we know how it does. The incense in the Psalms is specified to be likened unto prayer. The burnt offering, so far as we've been given to understand up till now, uh, has been uh, in the antitypical system. Basically, the equivalent of it in the antitypical system is the. Lord's Supper, but then we also have the grain offering and the drink offering. Well, what's that? How does that come together? So I don't know. And I would think that understanding those aspects for the daily offering would be somewhat prerequisites to understanding the doubling of those things on the seventh-day Sabbath. So that's one element. 
And then you have new moons, which on their own, there were special sacrifices for new moons. And one of, one of these sacrifices was actually uh, a sin offering. And, but there were other sacrifices, there's other elements. Again, all these things, we are at the beginning, really, of understanding how to keep the priestly law in antitype. Now, lately, our Heavenly Family has been showing us a whole lot more, a whole lot more about it, um, and just understanding the system in general, like the whole idea of ritual purity, that's a huge subject. There's a lot to that. That's a huge part of the priestly law. So they've been guiding us to understand these things better, but we're still at the beginning. Now, one of the things that um, was shown in the Lord's Supper from the Table to the Altar and Back Part 2, it's called Christ in the Daily Meal. Uh, This is, again, the second part of the Lord's Supper series that Doug wrote. He showed how, generally speaking, the meaning of the burnt offering is the same as the meaning of the Lord's Supper. And the meaning of the sin offering is the same as the meaning of the foot washing. Generally speaking, it's not necessarily that every burnt offering corresponds. Like every single time there was a burnt offering of the type, there must be a Lord's Supper in the added type. Um, for instance, there's times when you're supposed to offer many animals at a given time in one day um, that are many burnt offerings, and sometimes even many sin offerings. So does that mean in that one day that we are supposed to eat, you know, ten meals that are suppers of the Lord and wash our feet 13 times? You know, seems a little impractical. So it seems like there's something beyond that. It doesn't just correspond to one-to-one ratio. It's more the principle behind the burnt offering being the same principle behind the Lord's Supper. The principle behind the sin offering being the same principle behind the foot washing. Um, So from that, we've come to realize that on the new moons and on the feast days, there are sin offerings. There are no daily appointed sin offerings, but there are monthly and annual appointed sin offerings. And so part of the new moon is foot washing. That's part of the observance of a new moon. And it's part of observance of feasts as well. Of course, uh, Passover, we do a foot washing before the Passover meal, which, by the way, um, in Scripture, there's no such thing as a Passover Seder meal. There's no, uh, you know, the... Typically in Judaism, there's a, they have what's called the um, Haggadah, which is basically a written manual for how to keep the Passover Seder meal. And the Haggadah has developed over many centuries. Um, the most recent additions to it, I think, other than modern additions, but going into uh, the Middle Ages, and so on. I think there were even editions as late as the 14th, 15th century. You know, it's a developing tradition. But there's no uh, actual evidence of a Seder meal as we know Seder meals going back into the time of Jesus. Um, so there's no, you know, when we talk about a Seder meal, for most Jews, that means that there's different cups, there's different dishes that you have, different specific parts of the meal, eggs and all these different things that aren't commanded anywhere in Scripture, not even mentioned anywhere in Scripture. Um, so, but there is a meal. There's a simple meal that Christ had with his disciples for their last Passover. And it had two significant elements, the bread and the wine. And um, so we have a Passover meal. Passover is a day in the year where in addition to having the two meals at the third and ninth hour, there's another meal uh, afterward, after the sun goes down. That's it, Passover meal is to be eaten in the dark. Uh, not that you have to have your lights out, but it's after. Well the after sunset. Well after, yeah. In fact, in the um, recording of it, 
at the Last Supper with Christ talks about after they were done with their meal and they sang a song that they went out to the garden around midnight. Yeah. And actually, we'll mention also that um, in Exodus, it actually talks about how that night is, you know, the Passover night is a night of, I forget. Some kind of a vigil. Vigil, so, that's the word it used, yeah. yeah. It's a vigil. Like, basically, you're supposed to stay up. All night. All night. So that's actually commanded in Exodus. Which makes sense when you think of how Christ took Peter and who, who all did he take with him um, to pray? I think it was Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. Yeah. So, okay. And he took them a little bit further along into the garden with him. But then he went a little further past them to pray. And he wanted them to watch. They were supposed to stay up all night and watch with him, yeah. And so he, you know, you know the story. He came back and he found them sleeping. He's like, you're sleeping, really? You know, I asked you to stay awake with me. And I just always thought it was, oh, he just wanted them to stay awake. But it's actually part of the observance is what it seems to be. Yeah, in Exodus it it says that. Um, I'll I'll just mention that at that time, following Christ's example, for Passover, we have foot washing prior to the Passover meal. And then on other feast days, we do as well, like tabernacles. And so far as we know, I mean, there's, here's the thing, in tabernacles, there's sin offerings every day. I'm not sure if, if that means that we're supposed to have foot washing every day or not. Typically, we've just done it the first day. But again, that's something we are totally, like, I I would be surprised if we right now are observing the times for washing feet exactly as we should. I I just think there's so much that we don't know on that subject that it would just be surprising if we happen to just have it right. (laughs) So, but it's definitely during the feasts is a time to do foot washing. Um, And then here's the thing. Sometimes you can have a seventh-day Sabbath that falls within a feast, like within the Feast of Unleavened Bread or the Feast of Tabernacles. And those are called high Sabbaths. It's a, a Sabbath within a feast. And then you can have other times where the festal Sabbath or a new moon falls on a Seventh-day Sabbath. So that's more than it being just within the week of a, a feast. It's actually uh, falling on another Sabbath. Um, so far as the scriptures that I'm currently aware of, I don't know of anywhere that actually refers to the new moon as a Sabbath. Um, in the fullest sense of the term, there are definitely scriptures that talk about uh, how it is a day of worship and how we are not supposed to do commerce on the new moons and different things like that. Um, but there's, in other words, we shouldn't do servile work, just like on the festival, you know, the annual Sabbath. There's no servile work. But the seventh day Sabbath, for instance, is no manner of work. That's different than no regular work, um, no business, no, you know, that sort of thing. So um, while we are not supposed to be preparing food on the seventh-day Sabbath, so far as we know, it's entirely fine to prepare food on a new moon or on a festal Sabbath. So long as um, it's not on the seventh-day Sabbath. Yes, yeah, so long as it's not on the seventh-day Sabbath. Yes. Or... The Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is also, uh, we are commanded to do no manner of work on the Day of Atonement. So, again, all this is, um, as far as we currently understand, if there's anything, you know, there's other scriptures like the Temple Scroll or this or that, that we have not yet familiarized ourselves with to the extent that we need to become familiarized with these things. And if we find that there are uh, places that say no manner of work, even on new moons, then, hey, if that's from our Heavenly Family, then we will follow that. But just saying, so far as we know right now, 
there's no restriction on um, doing certain types of work like cooking or whatever on a new moon. So basically for a new moon, we have foot washing. Uh, I believe it's, I forget which psalm, I think it's Psalm 81, if I'm remembering correctly, talks about playing music on new moons. Uh, we should definitely play music. It's a day at least of some music. Um, having a meeting, receiving the message of present truth, whatever our Heavenly Family intends to give us for any given month, that's all part of the observance of the new moon. Also, blowing the trumpet. The trumpets were to be blown on the new moons, and that's a symbol of sounding the alarm, proclaiming the message of warning. And so we ought to do that on the new moons to those who do not know present truth. You know, we ought to speak truth amongst uh, each other, amongst ourselves, but we also ought to proclaim the message to others. And again, in a way that will be most helpful for the other person. Absolutely. It's not to say that because it's a new moon and it was blowing a trumpet, oh, I'll, I'll put it like this. The antitypical trumpet blast isn't a shout through a bullhorn. It's just proclaiming the message. And it is warning, and it does have seriousness to it. It does have uh, alarm associated with it. Um, so that's good. But it, again, in the way that will help the person the most. Yeah, it's, it's not a reason to uh, say the most shocking thing that you can think of to a person to try to rouse them out. You know, yeah. that, that probably will just totally turn them off. Absolutely. Yeah, so those are the elements that we're aware of as far as new moon observance. I don't know, uh, you know, the re a regular observance of new moon versus a new moon that falls on a seventh-day Sabbath. The only difference that I really know of as far as observance would be that you just you wouldn't do any matter of work, whereas on a regular new moon that's not on a seventh-day Sabbath, uh, you could certainly uh, prepare your food and things like that. So that's, that's all that I am really aware of, but it's something to study into more. Amen. Thank you for that additional clarification. Yeah, that was really helpful. Sure. Awesome. Thank you, Heavenly Family. Hey, I just wanted to check with you, Leroy, if you happen to find uh, that place in your notes. Yes, I did. Hey, awesome. I got two of them, actually. One was okay. when Carol and we were talking on the uh, other meeting the other day about receiving life. And I, I thought it was just a matter of where we decided to live by principle and not by feelings and emotions. But what does it mean when you to receive life? What's the physiology or the, or the... Is there something that changes in your mind or body or something? Or, is okay. It a new mind? Sure, that's a good, uh, really good question. So first, we have to define what we're talking about. Um, our mind is just simply our way of thinking. Our body is, well, <laughs> I guess that's pretty self-explanatory. Our body, composed of limbs, torso, head, brain, all of that. Um, The new birth experience and receiving life, those are the same. Those are both different metaphors for the same experience. To receive life in Scripture, when it, it talks about, um, let's just take Ephesians chapter 2, for instance. You know, 
we who are dead in trespasses and sins, but have been raised together, you know, in new life in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, Romans 6, you have those sorts of things. Paul, Galatians 2, 20, I live, nevertheless not I. You know, he talks about how he's living the life of the Son of God. Uh, Romans 5 talks about being justified by faith and how that is receiving righteousness and receiving the life of Christ. In John chapter 1, it talks about the light that was in the world. And the light was the life of men. Okay, so this life, receiving life, is receiving light. Light is a symbol of truth. Uh, life and the life of Christ and the righteousness of Christ, again, they're equated in um, Romans chapter 5. Righteousness is pure, unadulterated truth. Now, righteousness is right doing. Those things are actually very much so the same idea. It's just that it's specifying, when you say righteousness is right doing, that is specifying the carrying out of the truth in your life. So truth, again, we've talked about how truth and reality are synonymous. Um, another way to put that is that truth is that which corresponds to reality. In other words, if you say something or you think something, in order for that to be true, that thought or that, uh, those words have to correspond with the way things actually are with reality. So all of what I'm saying so far, what that is telling us is that to receive life is to receive the truth and to carry it out. To receive the righteousness of Christ is to receive truth and to carry it out. Now that, to receive truth, truth is, again, an idea that corresponds to reality is truth. So it's receiving a different way of thinking or different content to our thoughts and different um, structure to how we go about thinking. In Isaiah 55, it says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. For my thoughts, well, he says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. He says that my ways are so much higher than your ways. Isaiah 55 lays these things out. It says in Scripture, uh, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Um, the mind is the way of thinking. <clears throat> to receive life is to receive a new way of thinking. Our old way of thinking is called the carnal mind. That's the mind which acts according to the temptations of the flesh. So here we are, we have fallen bodies. In other words, our bodies are degenerated. We have sickness and pain and all these other things. Our brains don't function as well as they should. And all of that provides temptations for us. And so the carnal mind is the mind which basically allows itself to be ruled by those temptations. So it gives in to those temptations. It doesn't become the master over those temptations. It is enslaved by those temptations. Not that it has to be. It's choosing to be. So that way of thinking is the way of thinking that basically doesn't stand up against temptation. That's the way of thinking that we've been operating in from the first time we sinned. So the mind of Christ is the mind which resists temptation in all circumstances. It's a way of thinking that instead of being dominated by how we feel, because, you know, and we, we, the reason why we feel this way is because, oh, well, we have these different temptations uh, that come from external circumstances or even our own physical infirmities, whether it's uh, dealing with our arm, our leg, our stomach, our brain, whatever it may be, our, our 
fallen physical nature provides temptations to us. And the mind of Christ does not give in to that. Those things can influence our emotions, and our emotions can influence our way of thinking if we allow them to. And so the carnal mind goes with that rather than with reason and truth. The mind of Christ is the mind dominated by reason and truth. That is what the new birth and receiving life is about, receiving that new way of thinking. So again, our mind is just our way of thinking. It's not some independent part of us. Our, it's not actually, you know, our mind is not a, an independent thing. It's, in one sense, it's a thing. You know, a noun is a person, place, or thing. Migration, is that a thing? Well, in one sense, it's a thing. But there's no independent migration. Migration is a word that we use to describe uh, objects. Let's just take birds moving from one physical location to another physical location. No physical object there is migration. No thing there is migration. Migration is what those things are actually doing. Thoughts are processes of the brain. Our way of thinking is the trend of our thoughts. That's all it is. It's the trend of our thoughts. There's not a part of us that is our mind, unless we understand it correctly, in that it is our way of thinking. So there's no uh, change of that. It's not like our current way of thinking or our current mind, like our current personality, our current, um, you know, everything that, uh, you know, our self-identity and things like that, it's not like that is removed from us and then a new one is put into us. Because it's not something that is in us to be taken out or that even could be taken out and replaced with another thing like it. Because it's not some substance of mind or something like that. It's just the way we think. So that's the first thing. On the, the second aspect is the body. There's no physiological change of receiving the life of Christ. Our bodies are not changed when we receive the new birth. Our bodies stay exactly the same. Uh, the idea that our bodies change when we receive the new birth is actually the teaching of holy flesh that Ellen White talked about and spoke against. Um, and that's what many, probably the majority of Seventh-day Adventists, unfortunately believe, not knowing that they believe it. Uh, it's just because they put that off to the second coming, but they believe that we can't actually be free from sin until our bodies are changed. So being made actually righteous and having a body changed are tied together in the minds of most uh, Adventists and probably Christians in general. Um, so yeah, there's no physiological change, that, no change in our question. blood or brain. Yeah, that was your I, question, I, right? I was, I was wondering, is there something changes in our body or our mind, or is it or changed by beholding by beholding the truth in Christ or? That's what changes, gives us a new way of thinking and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's just using our free will to decide to accept the way that our heavenly family thinks and to no longer think in the sinful way that we've thought for our, our whole lives, basically. And that's it. Thank you for straightening that up. Amen. That's a really important issue. When when you say you receive life or you receive the mind of Christ, it sounds like you're actually something's happening. You know, you're getting a different spirit instead of your spirit. Or my my other question was similar to that, but when we have faith in God. What does that mean? What do we have faith in? His power, his word, his 
what does that mean to have faith in God or in Christ? Or... Okay, that's good. Um, now, first, I'll just say that can be used in many different contexts. Um, the whole idea of faith in God, that can be used in many different contexts, and it has different nuances depending on the context. <clears throat> so faith is essentially trust. So if you're in a situation where you're being persecuted, um, then your faith in God is you're trusting that he will deliver you from that persecution or that he will uh, he has your best interests at heart and he will bring about the right thing, um, that he's able to give you victory in your temptation, whatever the case may be. Um, so it really depends on the circumstances. To have faith in God to receive justification is to place yourself wholly in his hands to trust in him for everything, to trust that his word is true and that he is able to deliver you. And, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an entire trust. It encompasses all of those aspects. It says anything that's not of faith is sin. Or there's yeah. lots of quotes about faith. I had some written down here, but I can't find my paper. <laughs> no problem. Um, so did you have any other questions about that? Did you want me to kind of expand on any particular aspect? Yeah, there's a lot, like transgression of the, or breaking the commandments of sin, but it says anything we do that we don't do out of our faith in Christ is sin. You know, it's not only breaking the commandments themselves, but anything we would do with the wrong motives or do it because of our desire instead of, or not we desire, but we do it without Christ in mind, you know, we're, we're doing it without even thinking about him as sin. Sure, so those two things actually go together because it's not that, um, you know, when, when you say that sin is transgression of the law, that in itself is very broad. So it's not that sin as transgression of the law is one thing, and then even beyond that, doing things that are not of faith is sin. No, it's, it's actually the same thing. Anything that is done not of faith is actually a transgression of the law. The law demands that we love God with our whole heart, soul, and being. Well, if we love God with our whole heart, soul, and being, we will have trust in God, have faith in God. And any lack of faith in God is a lack of love for God. We will believe him. When we disbelieve him, we call him a liar. Amen. Absolutely. Faith is believing in the word of God to do the thing which it promises to accomplish. And so That's when we don't act... Go ahead. What are you saying? Okay, well, I was going to say, and so when we don't act in faith, we don't believe the word of God to do what it says it's going to accomplish. So what we do is we call God a liar. Which is breaking a commandment. Yeah. yeah. Right. Can I add something need... else? Go ahead. Sure. And when we have faith, then we are faithful. You know, just like a spouse being faithful. You know, then, then we yeah. act with, then we're faithful to our heavenly family. Amen. Right, we're living for them. We're not living for part for self and part for them. Whatever we do, Absolutely. our work, our work, our play, our whatever we do, we're doing it with them in mind, you know, to I want to please them, not anybody else. Absolutely. Yeah, so it's, you know, in Revelation it talks about having the faith of Jesus and keeping the commandments of God. 
You know, those things go together. And so faith, true, genuine faith, automatically includes and leads to keeping the commandments. A lack of faith automatically includes and leads to breaking the commandments. So those two things go right together. Hmm. All right, well, I just wanted to ask if anyone had any other questions or comments uh, on these same topics or on the message in general. Um, And if not, going a little bit more specifically in the direction of the community rule and the Dead Sea Scrolls and all that. I have a comment. Sure. Okay. Well, I was just thinking about how this, uh, how the gospel relates to the everlasting covenant. And when we let Yahweh be our Elohim, when we uh, let God be our God, then we let him rule, and that even means ruling over our thoughts, every single thought. And even, you know, ruling over our our motivation. And then the other thing I wanted to mention, going back to what Christina brought up, um, well, anyway, it led into talking about uh, the night of Passover, and when Christ Um, friends who went with him to pray didn't stand watch and how that relates to um, you know the ceremonial law regarding that that Teresa brought up anyway Sister White says something in Christian Experience and Teachings of Ellen G. White (laughs) page 221 she said and she's quoting Isaiah 21 12 God's watchmen are to stand on the walls of Zion and to give the warning. The morning cometh, and also the night, the night wherein no man can work. So I was just thinking that, you know, that might have some connection to this, you know, aspect that we're told about, that we're supposed to, um, you know, we're supposed to stand guard. We're supposed to stand watch. Yeah, very interesting. It's something that... um the first time I noticed that was actually in writing an answer to a question for the Silver Trumpet. Um, And I read a passage in Exodus that deals with this. And I had only ever read it in the King James Version before. And in the King James, this is totally obscured. And so it was just, yeah, it was interesting reading it again. Um, I'm trying to remember which issue of the Silver Trumpet it is in so that anyone who wants to can go back over it. I'm thinking it's Silver Trumpet Volume 1, Numbers 10 and 11. Let's see here. Okay. Yeah, I I think that that is the number. Um... There's a question on, let's see, when to eat the Passover, the 14th or the 15th. I believe it is in there where it addresses um, that issue of staying up and so on and so forth. Um, So that starts on, again, it's the Silver Trumpet, Volume 1, Numbers 10 and 11. And this starts on page 63. Okay. Um, and I, since I don't know exactly which verse it is again, I'm not going to look for the specific verse now just in case it takes too much time. Um, did anyone else have comments or questions? I thought I heard somebody say this that they only ate bread and wine at the communion supper. I thought they ate the the lamb, or is that something different? Well, here's the thing. We have no record anywhere in Scripture of 
anyone eating a meal that was composed solely of bread and wine. Right, um, that's what I was thinking, but I thought I heard somebody say that, you know, that it was bread and wine, but it was a real meal, regular meal, as far as I understand. So the way to deal with things like that is, you know, if someone says something like that, then it's entirely fitting to ask them for their evidence for that. Um, because that's, it's a claim that someone is making. And so unless someone is able to provide sufficient evidence to substantiate that claim, there's no reason to believe it. And sometimes merely asking someone, some, you know, someone may have just accepted the thought because they heard it somewhere. And then just asking them might make them realize, oh, wait, I actually don't know. I don't actually have any evidence for that. And that might help them a lot. I had someone ask me recently, um, <clears throat> they had someone tell them that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead because he didn't really die. He was just comatose. And so the person was asking me, like, well, how do you, how do you answer that? And, you know, ultimately, really what it comes down to is how, well, that's a claim that someone's making, that Jesus didn't actually die, that he was comatose. Is there any evidence at all to support that claim? And so you could ask the person who makes the claim. And if there's no evidence for it, then that in itself is enough reason to disbelieve the claim. Um, so I just wanted to mention that as another example for this principle because it's just really good to keep in mind when people make claims to ask for the evidence and to recognize that it's their responsibility to provide evidence. It's not your responsibility to disprove their claim. Likewise, if we're going to make any statements of claim, we should have the evidence to back it up. We should know why something is true before we go promoting that is true or even repeating that we think it might be true. It doesn't make sense to do that if we don't have any evidence for something. Amen. But most of us, I, I mean, I know this has been the case with me. I just, I hear something, it sounds good to me, you know, it fits with my ideology of things. Well, it must be true. Mm -hmm. And so I believe it, and it go, or this is how I used to be anyway. I believed it, promoted it, but and it didn't matter to me in the past. It didn't matter to me that I didn't have any evidence for it. And I realized how foolish that is. Mm -hmm. You respected yeah, all, the person that like, told it to you, maybe. No, I didn't even have to know the person. I didn't even have to know who said it. If I heard something that fit with my ideology, that I thought sounded good and seemed like, well, just I believed it because I wanted to, you know. And I just want to say... It. Um, in case anyone's thinking, oh, boy, Teresa used to be real gullible, <laughs> you know, we've all actually done this. I've done it, and all of us have done this. We, that's just how we have operated, <clears throat> unfortunately. But we're learning not to do that anymore. So uh, were there any other questions or comments on some of the principles we're talking about or anything else? I have one other question. I know there's been so many. Um, uh, Carol has this reading, a uh, divine plurality, um, on the, the question, um, God is a spirit or God is spirit. Um, and then I've been, so I've, I've finished that, I read that, and then in, I've been reading Enoch, and, in, and, and basically your divine plurality book is saying that um, spirit shouldn't be equated with something immaterial, that it's God is life, God is life-giving force, and uh, that it's material, that's, that, the, that the word, especially in Hebrew, 
spirit is a material thing and not an immaterial thing, which makes mm-hmm. sense. And then in Enoch chapter 22, um, in, in a lot of Enoch, it kind of seems like it's saying that like the spirit of Abel is um, being held in these, you know, prisons or just these material places. You know, like there's a, there's a material place where um, obviously watchers and that kind of thing are being held. But then it also seems like spirits of the dead are also held in certain smooth-sided um, receptacles of some sort um, that Enoch is seeing. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. Sure, excellent. Um, and actually... I think I can pull this up in the computer. I have, uh, in one of my copies of the Book of Enoch, I have this underlined. Okay, I was able to see here. First thing that I wanted to mention is that um, in the Book of Enoch, it uses the word spirit, just like in many other places throughout the Bible and so on. And we have become very used to understanding that word in an immaterial way. But that's not how one Enoch uses it. Just like that's not how other books in the Bible use it. And I just wanted to give an example of that before addressing 1 Enoch 22. Um, So in 1 Enoch chapter 15 verse 4, it says, Surely you, you used to be holy, spiritual, the living ones, possessing eternal life. Okay, so here it's, it's defining what it is to be spiritual. And it says here, living ones, possessing eternal life. Later in verse 6, it says, Indeed, you, formerly, you were spiritual, having eternal life, and immortal in all the generations of the world. Okay, so there it's telling you that what it is to be spiritual is to have eternal life. So it's not at all a matter of the nature of these beings. In fact, very much so in First Enoch, it's really clear that these are physical, biological beings because they have sex with human women and the women bear children. Um, And actually, I'll just mention historically, the reason why, or one of the reasons why one Enoch ended up being um, demonized in what became Orthodox Christianity is because of its overt physicalism. Very interesting. Today, if an Adventist picks up one Enoch and they read it, well, they'll think, oh, well, this must be spiritualistic, when historically people like Augustine and others in his time who really started to speak against one Enoch just thought, oh, it's crude. It's portraying angels as being physical. It's portraying spirits as being physical and all of this. That's just crude. It's, none of that stuff is physical. This is immaterial. So I think that's important to recognize that anciently, one Enoch was understood to be very physical in its description of angels, spirits, and all of that. And that's actually one of the reasons why it was uh, degraded in Orthodox Christianity. Um, So that just kind of shows how the reason why it comes across to us as spiritualistic in certain passages, it might not be that it actually is. It just might be that we have come to understand terms in ways that aren't really what they originally intended to convey. Uh, There's actually a New Testament Apocrypha book that Teresa and I have been reading lately that addresses that very idea, that terms can be deceitful. You know, people use the word God, and they think something entirely different than what the word actually means. And someone thinks church, someone thinks Holy Spirit, someone thinks, you know, all these different terms... And basically, the wicked gods have called what is good evil and what is evil good. And the terms that we use, you know, you can express the truth and you can express the lie 
and you can express both things using the exact same words. Why? Because people understand words to mean different things. So it's very important for us to get at the idea that lies behind the words. This, by the way, is one of the reasons why there's so much confusion about interpreting the Bible, because those same words mean so many different things to so many different people. Uh, so it's so important to get at the idea behind the words. Okay, so First Enoch 22, we were actually just reading this the other night, um, and certainly there are things in First Enoch 22 that in my first reading of it, it looks like it's spiritualistic. Um, so I'll, I'll read a passage here. Um, okay, First Enoch 22, verse 5. And Heavenly Family, guide us with this. Help us to have a coherent understanding. I saw the spirits of the children of the people who were dead and their voices were reaching unto heaven until this very moment. I asked Raphael, the angel who is with me, and said to him, The spirit, the voice of which is reaching into heaven like this, and is making suit, whose spirit is it? And he answered me, saying, This is the spirit which had left Abel, whom Cain, his brother, had killed. It continues to sue him until all of Cain's seed is exterminated from the face of the earth, and his seed has disintegrated from among the, uh, the seed of the people. And then it goes on. But basically, it talks about, okay, the spirits of the children of the people who were dead. Kind of interesting in verse 5 how it's not the spirits of the dead, it's the spirits of the children of the people who were dead. Kind of interesting. Um, that's potentially less... Uh, I'll put it like this. That's less open to spiritualistic interpretation. And this actually brings up a, a side note that I think I'll take a moment to explain quickly. Language in itself is a system of symbols. It's a system of symbolism. Uh, words don't have intrinsic meaning. If I say the word rock, well, no one who doesn't know English, when they hear me say rock, they're not going to think of a rock. Because <laughs> it, it doesn't actually convey anything to them. Those sounds, in and of themselves, are meaningless. It's just what we attribute to them. So that's what language is. It's different collections of sounds that people have assigned meaning to in order to convey ideas one to another. Um, now, what this means is that texts, no written anything, has intrinsic meaning. You know, when we're reading a translation of the book of Enoch, these words have no intrinsic meaning. But it's, it's symbols that are uh, for the purpose of conveying certain ideas. Now, what that means, too, is that texts need to be understood. They need to be, quote-unquote, interpreted. Um, they don't actually explain themselves in its most basic sense. Because if, even if a text explains itself later, it's still words explaining other words, and those words need to be understood in a certain way. So what this means is that in approaching a text, we have to understand that there's certain things which it will specify and certain things which it won't. And every text is open or not open to certain interpretations. This is one of the reasons why expressing things clearly, especially at certain points, can be very important. Because we have to understand when we're speaking to people, no matter what, what we are saying can be understood potentially in different ways. So sometimes it's very important to say things in a way that cancel out certain possible interpretations of our words. And sometimes it's important to say things in a way that leave it open 
to multiple interpretations. And in fact, Jesus often spoke in ways that were purposefully open for multiple interpretations because he intended different hearers to understand what he was saying differently. So this, it's, it's good to know, but I'm mentioning that to say, okay, so we're reading something like this. First Enoch 22, verse 5. I saw the spirits of the children of the people who were dead. Well, who are the people who are dead? Well, it's the people. Who do the spirits belong to? The children of those people. That is less open to a spiritualistic interpretation because it does not specifically say that the spirits that are being spoken of are the spirits of dead people. But again, we have to go and try and understand what this is intending to convey, what the author of this was intending to convey. But then later, we find this. And this is verse 6. I asked Raphael, the angel who is with me, and said to him, This spirit, the voice of which is reaching into heaven, like this and is making suit, whose spirit is it? Verse 7, And he answered me, saying, This is the spirit which had left Abel, whom Cain his brother had killed. It continues to sue him until all of Cain's seed is exterminated from the face of the earth, etc., etc. Okay, so here it has the spirit which had left Abel. That is more open to spiritualistic interpretation because someone could read that and say, see, a spirit is the immaterial part of the person and that part of the person, that's their intelligence, that's their consciousness, that's their whatever, and it says it left Abel. And now it's making suit. So, hey, you know. Um, so that's, that's one way that someone could interpret these words. Now, if that's what this is actually saying, then it is totally spiritualistic and thus should be rejected. However, I question whether that is really what this is saying. Um, one of the reasons why is that hinges upon the understanding that a spirit is uh, the consciousness of a person or an immaterial part of a person or whatever, rather than just the breath of a person. You know, spirit, breath, it's the same word. So the breath of Abel or the life of Abel, his life left him. And then you have the issue of and is now making suit. It's suing him. It's bringing a charge against him. Well, that sounds very um, personified. So the question is, is Enoch intending that to be taken as um, a, a detached or disembodied consciousness of Abel. First thing that I would point out is that this whole section in one Enoch is a visionary experience in which he's seeing things that are representative of other things. In other words, he's not seeing the realities themselves. He's seeing things that are representative of other things. Um, he sees various mountains. He sees um, these seven stars, which are like seven uh, fiery mountains. And he sees them, and what are they? Well, the angel tells him that those are angels that fell from heaven. Okay, so those stars, which are like mountains, are, are actually representative of angels. Those star mountains are not the realities themselves they are um, images which represent the reality. So this is speaking symbolically. So when something is metaphorical or symbolical, that um, means that, okay, well, it's not necessarily then talking, like when it talks about this, the spirit of Abel making suit, is it actually talking about this disembodied thing, first of all, there's no justification for interpreting spirit here as a disembodied consciousness. Um, you know, so is the, the making of suit or making a charge, is that really uh, 
to be taken literally, or is this part of the symbolism? Um, remember, too, that one Enoch opens with saying that Enoch uh, opened his mouth in parables and said all these different things. Okay, so he's speaking parables. He's speaking symbolically. Um, also, elsewhere in one Enoch, and I don't have it with me, so we'll have to go through and check this. Um, but in, I, I have it marked somewhere in a translation of the book of Enoch talking about the earth making suit or the earth crying out. Well, is that intended to be taken literally? Does the earth have a mouth? That's a, a good question. Yeah, I've actually cried out. Now, this, by the way, is actually very similar to something else in Genesis that talks about the blood of Abel crying out. Well, is that to be taken literally? Well, someone could interpret it spiritually in a, in a very spiritualistic sort of way to say, oh, well, his blood had some sort of spirit in it but that's not really the intention of the author of Genesis. It's not intending to convey the thought. I mean, it, there's there's nothing in, like, you go all throughout the Old Testament, and, and historians know this, by the way, that it, it, in the Old Testament you don't find a conscious state of the dead. You just don't find it there. Now, there's an, also, I'll mention, another passage in uh, Revelation chapter 6. And um, this passage could certainly be interpreted in a spiritualistic way just as much as this passage in 1 Enoch. Um, however, and Victor Hoddoff, by the way, he goes through this in his studies on the seven seals. There's a study called uh, To the Seven Churches. It's tract number 15, for those of you who want to check it out. There he goes through the seven seals. And then also um, Shepherd's Rod, Volume 2. Now, I'm going to read here Revelation 6, verse 9 and 10. This is what it says. Now, when the Lamb had opened, or sorry, when the Lamb opened the fifth seal... I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been violently killed because of the word of God and because of the testimony they had given. They cried out with a loud voice, How long, sovereign master, holy and true, before you judge those who live on the earth and avenge our blood? Okay, so there you have souls of those who had been martyred or violently killed because of the word of God and because of the testimony they had given. And those souls cry out with a loud voice, how long, sovereign master? Okay, so there you have the dead crying out to God. Same sort of thing you have in one Enoch. But then, wait a second, if that's the case, then Revelation would be, if it's to be interpreted in a spiritualistic way, would be definitely teaching the conscious state of the dead. And then the resurrection that it mentions at the end of Revelation kind of stops making sense. You know, it's not all that coherent. Um, however, Revelation chapter 6, this is the seven seals, and the entire thing is clearly symbolic. Very clearly symbolic. And Victor Hoddoff goes into um, what this symbolizes. Christ, by the way, himself used symbols that the symbols themselves were using um, spiritualistic imagery. And he used that to convey uh, a truth, like take the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Well, you have someone dying and they're talking. 
going to Abraham's bosom and all these different things. That's spiritualistic imagery. Christ was using it because in his day, among the Jews, there had been a lot of Greek influence and a lot of people had taken on spiritualistic ideas. Not everyone. It was something that was debated in Judaism. So Jesus took this imagery and he used it to teach the lesson that this life is when we have to make our decision. We can't wait until we're dead. (laughs) We can't. We have to choose now in this life. That's what Christ was trying to show in the parable of the rich man Lazarus. And again, it's clearly a parable. He was not conveying the thought that there's actually this rich man who died and went there and did all these different things. He's giving a parable in which he's using spiritualistic imagery to teach a truth which actually runs counter to spiritualism. So it's, it's quite interesting how this plays out. But Revelation is doing that same thing. And one Enoch, again, it's speaking in, uh, especially that section of one Enoch is clearly symbolic. Um, that's easy enough to see just reading through the passage and seeing how the angel explains different things that Enoch sees. He's explaining things to be, uh, to be representative of other things. So clearly that's, that's what symbolism is. So because of all of that, I would say there's a few different elements to keep in mind. First, if any of these texts actually do teach spiritualism, then we need to be able to show it from those texts to see how they define it. Um, if we can show, yes, rather, you know, beyond just, oh, this seems to be spiritualistic to me. Well, it could just be using a spiritualistic image to teach something else without promoting a spiritualistic reality. So something that just comes across in a way that might seem spiritualistic to us isn't enough to show that it's actually spiritualistic. So we have to see, how does it define spirit? What is it talking about? When it talks about making a suit, does it talk about other things making a suit, which are clearly um, just talking about how people in the heavens are witnessing what's going on in the earth, and the situation cries out for justice, that sort of thing. Um, so that's, uh, that's the other aspect to check out. Like, okay, so how is it actually putting it within its own context? What is it intending to convey. If it's spiritualistic, toss it out. If it's not spiritualistic, then we have no reason to object to it. Uh, The other thing, the other principle involved, this is just to recap, is that we have other texts, Revelation, Luke, Genesis, which all contain... um, what might be understood as similar, and especially Revelation, very, very similar, similar passages that could just as easily be interpreted in a spiritualistic light. And if we have good reason to believe that these passages and that the writers of these books were not promoting spiritualism, then that should at least have us open to the idea that maybe the author or authors of one Enoch were not trying to promote spiritualism. Um, so it's just using these other texts to check ourselves to say, okay, am I judging this uh, fairly? Am I considering all the aspects that I need to consider in order to understand what it is saying, and so on. Um, so I think that those are some of the principles involved. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, it helps a lot. Um, yeah, I thought when, when I was reading Enoch chapter 22, it, it does sound a lot like Genesis with um, Abel's blood. And, and um, you know, I thought of the martyrs under the altar as well. I guess, I guess I'm not real good at knowing, you know, you know, where the corporeality of the spirit, you know, the spirits, where that's not symbolic and then where the spiritualism is symbolic. Because it seems like, like I'm, because I'm, I don't like spiritualism. I, to me, that's a, a huge uh, weight off my shoulders that spiritualism is, is not true. 
So mm-hmm. I do have a preference that it's not true. And so when, when um, you know, I guess I'm just afraid sometimes I'm reading with a preference, you know, because there's, there's other parts here of Enoch where I see the spirits being corporeal. For example, like you said, these, you know, watchers, you know, are, are copulating with human women and having children. And, and um, I'm assuming that that's not symbolic. Um, I'm assuming that there is actually real prisons you know, un- under the earth or in the earth somehow for um, for Azazel and these other spiritual real beings. Um, but I guess I guess I'm just still not very good at um, determining when something's real and when something's symbolic. But okay, um, there's a couple other aspects that I want to mention in relation to this. Um, and you've probably read this before and everything, but I just want to mention it because I think it's so useful and so important. In the Silver Trumpet, Volume 1, Number 9, there's a question and answer dealing with figurative language, literal language, and how that relates to spiritualistic language or material language. Um, Because very often... um, like sometimes people think that symbolism and spiritualism, uh, and by the way, Mary, I just want to say that I understand that this is not what you're doing, but this is one of the factors that comes into play for everyone when reading any of these passages where there's symbolism and other things and uh, where things could be taken spiritualistically. So I just want to explain this for the benefit of everyone. It's very common for people to think that a symbolic interpretation and a spiritualistic interpretation are the same thing. And interpreting literally and interpreting it in a way that it's material are the same thing. That's actually very often the opposite of the case. Very often, spiritualistic interpretations are taking a passage, the wording of a passage, to be literal when the intention of the author did not mean it to be literal. It was actually metaphorical or it was symbolic. Um, That's often what's happening. And people, you know, symbolism is not actually um, spiritualistic or immaterial or anything like that. All symbolism is, is you're using words to describe other things other than the immediate meaning of those words. So you're using, you know, a symbol of a tree. You know, you talk about a tree, but really you mean a person. You're using the tree to represent the person. Well, that's not, you know, a tree is physical, a person is physical. There's nothing immaterial about that. It's just a representation. But I won't go into all the details on that. That's in the Silver Trumpet, Volume 1, Number 9, in the Question and Answer section. Um... There is something else I want to mention about this in terms of understanding uh, kind of what to take as symbolic, what not to take as symbolic. Um, And also, Mary, you mentioned about corporeal spirits and then, um, you know, are we supposed to take when it uses the word spirit here as a corporeal thing or not? Um, So I think these are a couple of elements that will be good for us to talk about. I'm just going to go and grab um, a book here. Just one moment. Okay. So, um, first I just want to mention how different words have different meanings in different contexts. And we all know this. You know, you can use, I mean, I'm just trying to think of an example um, trunk. The word trunk, that can mean many different things. The trunk of a car, the trunk of an elephant, whatever. There's, there's many different meanings of uh, different words. And it all depends on context. And sometimes people think that in the Bible it must not be like that, or in Hebrew it must not be like that. Well, and that's not really the case. You know, Hebrew's a language, just as any language is. And, um, In the Bible, you have different words that are used in different contexts. Spirit is one of those words. Sometimes the word 
uh, spirit, or in Hebrew, ruach, is used to refer to a being. And in that sense, uh, it would most properly, perhaps, or it's hard to say most properly because there might always be a better way to put things, but um, a good way to translate the word spirit when it is referring to a being is breather. The word spirit, uh, in its kind of more basic meaning, means breath or air or wind. And so if someone is a spirit, they are a a breather. Um, But again, it can also just mean wind. You know, the word spirit can just mean wind as in the wind uh, that's coming from the east or whatever. Then it can also mean... That's what I was thinking. Spirit means breath, and breath is a living being. It's not a dead being. Well, breath itself is just air passing in and out of the lungs. Someone who breathes can be called a breather. So a spirit referring to a person is one thing. They they can be called a breather. That's one way to translate the word spirit. And then you have breath. The actual, um, you could have a single breath, whether inhaling or exhaling, and that's the air passing into or out of the lungs. Then you could have the wind. And this is all just the same word, you know. Uh, And then you you have the different meanings, uh, uh, like even, even within a certain meaning of the word, let's say breath, it can be used in... Um, an idiomatic way. Like someone could say, um, you take my breath away. Well, that's an idiom in English. And it, sometimes it's literal, where, you know, you took someone's breath away. But sometimes it's not literal. Sometimes it's just a figure of speech to express how, like, wow, that really took me back. Well, that's another idiom. But the fact is that even when you're using it to mean a certain thing, there's idiomatic usages of that. And so we have to come to learn how each individual author is using these this language, what they mean by it when it talks about someone's breath left them. That's an idiom in Hebrew for they died. They stopped breathing. Their breath left them. Their breath is, you know, what keeps them alive. They're breathing in and out. So for their breath to leave them, and basically it's, it just can't be used as an idiom for they died. Um, and while uh, well, you could translate that, their spirit left them. You know, but it's just their breath left them, and the point is that they died. So there's different idioms, there's different meanings to words, and it's important to get to know it. Also, language develops over time. So the Hebrew of Moses' day was different from the Hebrew of David's day. The Hebrew of David's day was different from the Hebrew of Nehemiah's day. The Hebrew of Nehemiah's day was different from the Hebrew of Jesus' day, which was different from the Hebrew of the rabbis, which was different from the Hebrew of Israel 1948. And the Hebrew has developed till this day. Um, so it's, it's just good to know... Yes? What was... Hebrew originally a pictorial, somewhere I heard that Hebrew was a pictorial language to start with or something like, you know, just pictorial. Right. So Hebrew, um, I don't know all of the history of it. Uh, That's something to be studied into. Some people say it started as an oral language, then it developed, and there's, generally speaking, though, Looking at archaeology, it looks probably to be the case that Hebrew had um, it, the characters of the Hebrew alphabet were in some sense pictorial, not like the Chinese language, not to that extent, um, but roughly pictorial, but it was also phonetic. You know, phonetic languages seek to represent in their alphabet sounds that can be put together to form different words. That's not how uh, the Chinese alphabet works, for instance. So, but 
not to get uh, too far onto onto that issue, uh, but the short answer is, yeah, most likely it was pictographic, and then it took on another form, um, which they called Paleo-Hebrew, and then after that, which was basically the Phoenician script, looks like Phoenician, and then after that it took on an Aramaic square script um, in sometime around the 5th century or so, BCE. So, here's the thing. Hebrew developed over time, language developed over time, idioms developed over time. So one part in the Bible may use certain words certain ways that might be different from how other parts of the Bible use those same words or expressions. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Because, uh, hey, the Bible is written at different times by different people. Okay, so that's, that's the one aspect I wanted to mention. Um, that I think is helpful in understanding, okay, when I read the word spirit here in one Enoch, well, in this place, it's definitely talking about a being, a corporeal being. And in this other instance, I don't know. I mean, will I have to interpret it to be a a corporeal being here too in order to be consistent? And the answer to that is no. It's because even the same author will use a certain phrase in different ways depending on context, and we actually do it all the time in everyday life. Um, The other aspect that I want to mention in terms of knowing kind of what is uh, symbolic and what is not in a certain writing, now this is going to vary a lot from writing to writing. Each writing has its own structure and this and that. But since we're talking about one Enoch, I'm going to mention some things about one Enoch. Um, so first I'll mention actually how um, last fall when Norman came up here to help us out on the property and so on, I had the book here, The Complete Dead Sea Scrolls in English by Giza Vermez, and Norman started reading it. And then he... Uh, and he had got a, a quite a ways through even while he was still here. And then he got back uh, to the States and, you know, he got his copy of it and read the whole thing. And I was like, man, he read the whole thing. That's awesome. <laughs> I was so pumped about that. And I was like, man, I need to read the whole thing. I haven't read the whole thing yet. So I did, you know, went through and read the whole thing and it it was that ins- it basically it inspired me to like yes I just I just need to go through from beginning to end so I, you know it's a good way to just go through the whole thing without missing parts so now I've started to read the Old Testament pseudepigrapha edited by James Charlesworth uh, two volumes and I'm just starting from the beginning going through and the first book is the Book of Enoch. So I've been going through and paying attention to things, noting things, um, underlining, highlighting, whatever. Um, things that are significant that may be useful in, in um, writing and so on. And also I've just been asking serious questions about it as I've been reading, as I've been doing now with everything that I read. And... You know, we've talked about many times on the calls when we're reading something, there's certain questions that we should ask. Does this claim to be inspired, a product of inspiration? What does it claim? What is it intending to say? Uh, does it claim authorship? Does it not claim authorship? You know, what, uh, what are these things? We can't just come and assume something we need to let the text speak for itself. So with the Book of Enoch, I've been doing that, really asking our Heavenly Family to guide me and to ask questions. So, you know, I started reading from verse 1. And it says, The blessing of Enoch, with which he blessed the elect and the righteous, who would be present on the day of tribulation at the time of the removal of all the ungodly ones. So I want to ask you guys here, just with me reading that, 
um, who is claiming to write that, to have written those words? Well, it's the blessing of Enoch. So, uh, I guess Enoch. <laughs> that's that's what most would probably guess, right? right? So now let me let me read the next sentence or so. And Enoch, the blessed and righteous man of the Lord, took up his parable while his eyes were open, and he saw. So who's claiming to write that? Someone else? Okay, right? I mean, here's the thing. Would Enoch write, quote, And Enoch, the blessed and righteous man of the Lord, took up his parable with his eyes open. No, no, he's speaking of this person in third person. And actually, so far, even in verse 1, the blessing of Enoch, that sounds like a title to something. Mm -hmm. The blessing of Enoch, which he blessed, uh, or with which he blessed the elect and the righteous who would be present on the day of tribulation, so on and so forth. Well, so far, it's, it's not ever saying, I, Enoch, this or that. So it's actually, we don't actually know who is claiming to write this because they aren't identifying themselves. They're just the narrating voice. And they're speaking of Enoch as a figure within what they're writing. So, and Enoch the blessed and righteous man of the Lord, took up his parable while his eyes were open, and he saw, and said, quote, now this is quoting what Enoch said according to this. This is a holy vision from the heavens which the angels showed me, and I heard from them everything, and I understood. I look not for this generation, but for the distant one that is coming. I speak about the elect ones and concerning them, so on and so forth. Okay, so let me ask you guys, who's claiming to write that part? I would say Enoch's writing that part. Okay, that's a possible... Thing to do. So let me let me give you uh, another example that's similar to this, and you let me know what you think. And this this is so helpful because as we read things, it's just so important. Um, okay, so I'm going to go now to the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, and this is just as an example. Um, so we open up at the beginning of Mark, and this is what it says. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Okay, so who's, who's claiming to write that? No one yet. No one yet. They don't identify themselves. And, you know, someone might say Mark, but there's nowhere in Mark where Mark claims to be written by Mark. So we don't know if Mark wrote it or, you know, Whatever, we don't know the person. It's written anonymously. So, now let me go to, um, let's see here. Okay, verses 14 and 15 of Mark chapter 1. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Okay, so who's claiming to write that part? This is Mark chapter 1? Yep, verses 14 and 15. And... Particularly verse 15 is what I'm asking about, but I had to read 14 for context to know who is speaking in verse 15. So who wrote, who's claiming to write what we find in verse 15? And anyone's free to answer, just so you guys know. <laughs> it's 
sound like somebody was there on the on the spot. It, the question, though, is who is claiming to write the contents of verse 15? It still doesn't say, did it? Or did I miss it? Well, the fact is, it still, it doesn't say, right? It's but, it's the same person who wrote verse 1. Now, someone might think, well, here, it just says that Jesus said the time is fulfilled. But here's the thing. We know when we're reading Mark, and he says, Jesus said, and then he quotes words of Jesus, he's not claiming that Jesus wrote that part of his gospel, right? He's just saying that Jesus said those things. So when we're reading one Enoch, and then it's talking, and it's clearly indicating that it's someone other than Enoch who is writing this, and then it says, Enoch said, and then it tells these words of Enoch, that that in itself isn't a claim that Enoch wrote that part of it. So that's, that's good to keep in mind. Now, that said, you do find elsewhere uh, throughout the New Testament where it'll say, Isaiah said, and then it'll quote something from the book of Isaiah. Okay, well, there you have a written source that a later writer is quoting and is saying, well, this person said that, and then it's quoting something that that person wrote. So that shows you that it might be quoting a previously written work, or it might be quoting um, what, you know, basically based off of an oral tradition, what someone said, or it might be um, more of a, a narrative than that. Like, okay, for instance, 4th Maccabees. I think everyone here has read 4th Maccabees. In 4th Maccabees, it gives very long speeches and conversations back and forth between the martyrs and Antiochus Epiphanes. Well, is it claiming that those martyrs said every single one of those words and that Antiochus replied and it's like, is it claiming that someone was there with an audio recorder and that later it was transcribed? Well, no, not really. I mean, people didn't have audio recorders. They didn't have ways to record things live like that as they're happening. You know, most people couldn't write, and if they could, they couldn't write well. So, 4th Maccabees is looking back on this well-known martyrdom, both of Eleazar and of the seven brothers and their mother, and knowing what they died for, knowing what their experience would have been, is now expressing in words that they probably didn't use the basic idea of what happened. It's kind of like if someone makes a, a movie that's based off a true story, but then they have to have all these other elements in there. I mean, even you read the book Desire of Ages, and Ellen White, she'll often say, like she'll be talking about Jesus' conversation with someone, and then she'll say, Jesus said, and then she'll start off with quoting something from the Gospels, and then she'll continue on in Jesus speaking first person. And she'll add all this stuff that's not in the Gospels. And he'll be saying things in contemporary English to her day and expressing things in a way that there's no way that he expressed them in that way in his time. But what she's doing is she's conveying the idea that he was conveying. But it's not the words that he was conveying. She's adding a lot to the actual content of the gospel record, but she's having Jesus say it in first person. Well, the the fact of the matter is Ellen White's not claiming that Jesus said those precise words. Ellen White is saying that this is what Jesus was trying to get across. This is what Jesus was communicating to those people or to that individual in whatever the circumstance may have been. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's nothing wrong with, with that at all. So you have a few different options. You know, you read one Enoch, and it could be whoever's... 
Why did I just you get one... to... Oh, go ahead. Okay, yeah, I was just going to say, you have a few options here in 1 Enoch and in many, many other texts. You read the first verse and the first half of the second verse, and it's being written in a way that it doesn't claim any authorship, and it's certainly, basically the only person that you know isn't claiming to be the author is Enoch, because that's the only person it's really talking about, and it's speaking of Enoch as someone other than the writer. Um, so then, then it goes to quote Enoch. So you have a few different options. Either it is the, you know, quoting a written source, like let's say Enoch wrote a book and now this is quoting from something that Enoch actually wrote. That's an option. Enoch said and then it quotes it. Or it's quoting from another book that records Enoch's sayings. You know, that's that wasn't written by him, but maybe someone else had uh, written something that was sayings of Enoch or whatever. But either way, those are both written sources, either something that Enoch himself wrote or something that someone else wrote, uh, which includes sayings of Enoch. That's an, an option, too. Um, but either way, you have those as options. And then you have the option of this is something that, based off of oral tradition, was something understood... Uh, as a saying of Enoch, as something that Enoch said, in which case, again, it's not going to be verbatim, just like the sayings of Jesus. They're different in the different Gospels. So they're not verbatim. You have Jesus saying the same thing in different ways in the Gospels. None of them are claiming to be his verbatim words. Plus, you have the language issue, which shows that they can't be his verbatim words, at least not how we're reading them. Um, or how they are in Greek, for that matter. And then you have, beyond that, you have the option of the writer not basing off of a oral tradition and not basing off of a prior written text, just communicating what Enoch uh, might have said or uh, the idea which Enoch was believed to convey, just like how Ellen White in Desire of Ages, when she does this where she's expanding on the words of Jesus and putting it in first person where Jesus is saying these things. Um, she's not basing it off of a previous oral tradition. She's not basing it off of a um, previous written text. She's writing it based off of the understanding that was given to her through inspiration of what Jesus was conveying, but not verbatim, not word for word. So she's expressing it in that way. So that, you know, when reading something like One Enoch here, those are different options, and perhaps there's different ways to find out. But it's a good thing to be aware, okay, well, what's, you know, claiming to be written by what? So we'll come back to Enoch here in just a moment. There's more that we want to say, but quickly, uh, before it gets too far off of what you were wanting to ask, Leroy, go ahead. I had to get my phone out of my pocket. Now, I was <laughs> sure. thinking that she was being led by the Sister Wisdom, you know, to write. And also I was thinking that the God's Word was originally passed on by oral tradition, so maybe they had better memories, too. Okay. You know, as far as, yeah, as, far as remembering what, what uh, the martyrs were saying, you know, so they could write it down later. Okay, so there's a few different aspects to that. First, yeah, Ellen White was totally led by the Spirit to write down what she did and everything, but she herself said that she has the liberty to write it in her own words and that she's not... Uh, that the Spirit did not communicate the words to her that she was supposed to write, other than there are instances where an angel said things, and Ellen White will put it in quotes, what the angel said. Um, of course, there are circumstances like that, but by and large, the vast majority of Ellen White's writings or the writings in the Bible are mm -hmm. not a product of verbal inspiration, of word for word, write this down. And it doesn't claim to be either, so we shouldn't make those claims for it. In fact, Ellen White, she said, it is not the words of the Bible 
that are inspired. She actually says that. It's not the words of the Bible that are inspired. It's the men who were inspired. And they wrote it in their own words. She actually expands on that more, and she says some incredible things. She, she says how God has not put his... This is a paraphrase, but he hasn't put his mode of thought in the Bible. God's reasoning, his mode of thought, are not represented in the Bible. That God worked through the thinking of these individual people. So that's all good to keep in mind. Um, so, and then the other aspect on people remembering things better being transmitted through an oral means, again, not in a verbatim way. The sense of something can be remembered. But, I mean, you read Second Maccabees, and it has the account of Eleazar. You read Fourth Maccabees, it has the account of Eleazar. They say different things. It has the same basic idea, but it's different in its expression. Same thing, I mean, if we, we wouldn't be able to say that the Gospels were, you know, that each Gospel writer remembered, okay, first of all, the, let's take Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All of those three Gospels are written anonymously. They don't claim to be written by, by any particular person. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those are later titles that were attributed to those Gospels, but they don't make claims to be written by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Even going with the traditional attribution, though, Luke was not a disciple or an apostle and wasn't there. Like Luke the physician, who people think wrote Luke, was not actually there. He was not an eyewitness to the, the life and ministry of Jesus. Neither was Mark. These are people who came around later. Um, Matthew is the only one in the traditional attribution who actually was a disciple. But again, Matthew doesn't, you know, the book of Matthew, or the gospel of Matthew, doesn't claim to have been written by Matthew. However, the gospel according to the Hebrews, in the records that we have of it, the records state, and this is going back even to the early 2nd century with Papias and other people, um, Ignatius and later Iranius and Clement of Alexandria, Jerome, um, Eusebius, all of these people from the early centuries talked about this gospel according to the Hebrews. It was written in Hebrew by Matthew the Apostle. And they say, that Jerome even calls it the authentic gospel written by Matthew in Hebrew letters. And so if that's the case, if the gospel according to the Hebrews was written by Matthew, then that's another story. <laughs> and then the gospel that we have wouldn't have been written by Matthew. But basically, there's, there's no evidence within the gospels themselves, in the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that they were written by people who actually heard Jesus. And they don't claim that. In fact, Luke, when he writes, he tells you that he's... You know, many people have sought to write these things, but he's done his research and he's using sources and he's putting down the account of the, uh, the events of the life and death of Jesus. So that's, that's what's going on in Luke. Now you compare those three synoptic Gospels because, again, they are similar. John is very different from them. Those three Gospels, sometimes they have word for word the same, and that's because they're quoting each other. They're actually two of the, well, basically, those Gospels are using each other as sources. Uh, of course, what I mean by that is that the later ones were using the earlier ones. Obviously not vice versa. Using them as sources. So they have them as written sources. And then there's many times where they differ from each other. And if it was based off of uh, remembering orally what Jesus said, and then the other gospel writer remembering orally what Jesus said, 
it's evident that they didn't remember word for word because the wording differs from gospel to gospel. It's, it's different. So we could potentially say that people remembering it orally, they remembered the sense of what Jesus said. And perhaps some specific things, like you find the same parables, even worded differently. So you can know, okay, well, Jesus gave this parable. Jesus gave that parable. You know, those are things that can be discerned. Like, okay, Jesus taught this, Jesus taught that. We can know what he taught. We can know what all these things are. But that's not the same as saying that we have a word-for-word account of what he said. Um, That's not typically how oral transmission works, and it's not how it's, you know, claimed to work in the Gospels or anything like that. So I hope that that helps to answer that question. Um, but to go back to... What was that? I said, yeah, that helps a lot. Uh, a lot. Thank you. Okay, awesome. And so I just wanted to mention with one Enoch, I wanted to go back to that too and just kind of mention what I've found so far in looking at it. So... Chapter 1, verses 1 and 2a, so the first part of verse 2, doesn't claim to be the words of Enoch. But then from chapter 1, verse 2b, so the second part, um, all the way to chapter 5, verse 10, which is the end of chapter 5, all of that actually does claim to be the words of Enoch. Again, whether it's claiming that Enoch actually wrote it or what, that's something to be investigated. But it's claiming to be the words of Enoch. So it's claiming to be a record of inspired sayings. So that's good to know. It's claiming to be a record of inspired sayings. Whether it's claiming to be written by someone who's inspired or not, that's another story. Um, By the way, there's other times where people like Joseph Bates or Jane Loughborough, early Adventists, were there with Ellen White while she was in vision, and she was saying things, and they wrote it down. Well, that's not claiming to be written by Ellen White, and some of them published it in their books, too. That's not claiming to be written by Ellen White, but it's claiming to give the words that she spoke. And For instance, Jane Loughborough, he records certain things that Ellen White said in vision, in his book, The Great Second Advent Movement. Ellen White, she recommended and promoted the book, The Great Second Advent Movement. So she probably wouldn't do that if he was lying about what she said in vision. So she um, basically put her stamp of approval on that, saying, yeah, basically that's what I said. And so that can be taken as a record of inspiration and should be very valuable, should be very important to us, just as, you know, we have the record of um, the sayings of Jesus in the Gospels, even though Jesus didn't write the Gospels, but we still consider them important because they contain a record of those words or of uh, those sayings, those teachings. So, again, one Enoch from chapter... 1 verse 2b to the end of chapter 5, that all claims to be the words of Enoch. And then what happens is from chapter 6 verse 1 all the way to chapter 12 verse 2, that switches to no longer claiming the words of Enoch again. It speaks of Enoch as a a person in its narrative. You know, it's telling this story of um, the sons of God, the daughters of men, you know, the watchers, and Enoch interacting with them, but it's not written in a way where it's, where it's claiming like, oh, well, I did this then, and then I did that. No, it's Enoch, he went from there to here, and he did this and that. So that actually tells you that, okay, well, that isn't part of the sayings of Enoch, which he's saying are parables. So, again, in chapter 1, when Enoch starts talking, he, 
he starts saying, you know, he saw these things, he saw these visions, and he, he's speaking for a, a generation in the future and all of that. But then when you get to chapter 6, and it switches out of being the words of Enoch, well, then you know that that's not necessarily him still talking about um, this future generation. You know, he's not any longer talking about the judgment and the end of sin and so on like he did in chapter 5. Now it's going into chapter 6, and it's not claiming to be written by Enoch. It's talking about Enoch. And that goes all the way up until chapter 12, verse 2. And then in chapter 12, um, verse 3 to verse 6, just this short little passage, it then has some words of Enoch, but it's claiming to be words of Enoch again. And then it goes back uh, in chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, no longer claiming to be Enoch. It says, as for Enoch, he proceeded and said to Azazel, so it's the voice of the narrator, not the voice of Enoch. Does that for chapter 13, verses 1 and 2? And then, chapter 13, verse 3, all of a sudden it's Enoch again. He says, then I went and I spoke to all of them together. And then from chapter 13, verse 3, all the way till the end of chapter 36, it's claiming to be the words of Enoch. So, again, whether that was from a written source, and this is just incorporated, because here's the thing. Uh, Like, I'll I'll mention um, the Gospels again. Most scholars have come to the conclusion that out of the Synoptic Gospels, and actually out of all the four Gospels in the New Testament, that Mark was written first. That's what most scholars have have concluded. That's something for people to look into. But whichever order it was, it doesn't really change the principle of what I'm about to say. But the idea is that Mark wrote his Gospel first. So that means Luke and Matthew are using Mark heavily. And there's times where they just quote huge chunks of Mark and include it in their own gospel. So it's in the ancient world, it wasn't uncommon for people to take a huge section from another book and include it in their own. So for instance, if there was this other book that was actually claiming to be written by Enoch, then whoever wrote what we now have as one Enoch could have taken that large section uh, from uh, basically that we have in 1 Enoch chapter 13 verse 3 to 1 Enoch 36 verse 4 and could have just quoted that whole thing and included it here as part of their narrative. Um, you know, that's entirely possible. Of course, there's other ways to, to understand it and there, may, there might be ways to determine what it is, whether this is prior written material or whether it's something that the author or authors of One Enoch are uh, creating as they're writing this. Um, That's something, again, there might be ways to determine that. But I think it's, it's very helpful to know, well, which, you know, what is claiming to be what? And because, you know, we need to learn to judge things on their own merit. And so in order to judge things on their own merits, we have to know what is it claiming for itself? What is it saying? So I I think it's good to go through some of this together, and then as we're reading, no matter what we're reading, it'll be good for us to keep this in mind. And some things will be more simple than others, like, you know, (laughs) from Paul to this person, you know, I mean, that's pretty simple. And then it's a quick little letter. Uh, Sometimes it's, you know, Paul and Sylvanus and Timothy to the church in this location. Okay, well, that's a letter written by multiple people. Um, And then you'll have Paul talking in first person throughout it sometimes. So, you know, you'll have things like that where it's more simple. And then you'll have other things where um, a, a certain writing is more it might be longer, it might have more parts to it, it might be less clear who's claiming to write certain parts of it, or, you know, whatever. But it's good to be aware of these things as we read, for sure. 
Any questions or comments? Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Heavenly Family. Any other questions or comments from people? So what do the scholars use to prove what they're saying? You know that Mark is the first writer and others use his. Well, there's a number of different elements to that. And you could probably look it up online and find more information than I'd be able to convey, partly because of time and partly because of me not knowing all of the reasons, because there's many reasons. But um, part of it is just basically what you can do with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They contain so many of the same stories that you can actually just lay them side by side together in columns and compare them. And you can see, um, like you can find out, okay, well, uh, this saying in Mark is different than how it is in Luke and, and Matthew. Why is that? What is different about it? And you might be able to determine, okay, well, um, which saying is going to be earlier? So, like, I'll just give an example of uh, the saying of John announcing Jesus uh, to baptize. So John says, I baptize with water, but he who comes after me will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's how Mark has it. In uh, Matthew, it says the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay, so either Matthew added and fire, or Luke took away and fire. You know? Um, so the question is, okay, well, which is more likely? Why would you take out and fire? You can maybe say why someone would add it, but maybe it's less likely that someone would take it away. You know, I mean, this is just, I'm coming up with a, a random example. Um, but there's other things. There's, there's things in um, Mark where a, a lot of the time the sayings in Mark are shorter and are more kind of difficult and... Um, not as smooth in how they're put. Like it might be a little bit more, um, I want to say broken English. Obviously it's not English, but it, it might be a little bit more just not phrased as clearly or as smoothly. And so then you compare it to, let's say, Luke or Matthew, and you can see how someone would smooth it out to kind of uh, expand on it a little bit to just make it more clear. But it's kind of hard to think of why, you know, if Mark had Luke before him, you know, the author of Mark had the writing that we now call Luke before him, and he could just write it out, why would he change it to make it a little less clear and a little more awkwardly worded? It's, it's just far less likely that someone would do that, whereas it's very easy to understand how someone with Mark before them if it's worded kind of awkwardly in a place or it could leave an impression that people wouldn't like, how you'd try and smooth it over or you would, you know, you'd do something like that. Uh, like in, in Mark, it, there's a place where um, someone says something to Jesus and it says that Jesus turned to them and he was angry and he said something. I, I forget exactly what it was. And then in the other Gospels, it doesn't say Jesus was angry. It leaves that part out. And it, well, you can imagine how it, it makes, it's more likely that someone would leave that particular aspect out of their source rather than someone having a source that doesn't include it and adds it in just because it's more challenging for people. Um, so those, those are some of the things. There's, there's many other reasons, different linguistic things and, and stuff like that, uh, doctrinal development or whatever. There's, there's a whole bunch of different things as to why scholars pretty much conclude that. Like probably like the vast, vast majority of scholars, like 99% 
probably uh, you know around there have concluded that Mark came first. And then there's debate over how that relates to the other Gospels. Like I'll I'll just mention right now, the dominant perspective is that Matthew used Mark and Luke used Mark, but there was neither Mark nor Luke used the other one. That's the dominant idea. But there are times where you have things in Luke and Mark and they share certain sayings or certain sections that aren't in, or sorry, it's in Luke and Matthew and they share things, share content that's not in Mark. So most scholars think they didn't get it from each other, they're using it from another source and scholars call that source Q, which is, it's a German for source, that's all that means. And so they've hypothesized another document that they used um, as a source without using each other. I'm not necessarily convinced of that or anything. I think that there's other things that are probably more likely than that. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to say that that's, that's what most scholars say, just so that you guys are aware of that. But I think people need to consider the possibilities of, hey, since Matthew and Luke share content that is not in Mark, it has to be at least considered that maybe Luke was using Matthew or Matthew was using Luke. Those things need to be considered based off of the documents that we have available to us before we postulate hypothetical texts that we don't even have. That's one of the things that scholars, you know, sometimes do is just throwing out um, hypothetical solutions with no actual basis in reality. And, I mean, yeah, maybe sometimes that ends up being right, but if you don't have any uh, actual documented evidence of it, it's kind of hard to substantiate, and then it kind of just comes to speculation. So I think it's better to stick with the evidence that we have before us, try to understand the relationship between the different documents, and to kind of, you know, to still be open to what is not known, you know, what can we know and what can't we know, those sorts of things. So I hope that, that helps to answer your question, Leroy. Thank you. So I know that this whole um, way of going about things is different from how we're used to. It requires, you know, a bit more uh, just awareness as we're reading things and asking different questions, looking at different things. Um, but it's, I think it's really important because this is how we're going to be able to actually judge things on their own merits. You know, how are we going to learn what Mark, you know, what was the purpose of Mark's gospel? Why did he write it? What is he trying to convey? And how does that compare to Matthew's gospel? You know, the author of Matthew, why did he write it? You know, if he already had Mark, then, you know, maybe and it probably isn't just to write a gospel because there's other gospels out there. Luke, at the beginning of Luke, it talks about other gospels out there. But yet Luke thought it was important to write, or whoever wrote Luke thought it was important to write this text. So they, they, had, they had a specific purpose in mind, an audience in mind, what they wanted to convey, and I think it's important to get to know that so that we can test each of these writings on their own merits and view them as the independent works that they are. So, anyways... Um, We've been on for quite some time here. We should draw the meeting to a close uh, pretty soon here. Are there that any can make last... us better students. Amen. You know, Absolutely. Know how to check things out better. Amen. All right. Well, um, I don't know if there's anything else from anyone before we close off. So I guess I'll just ask briefly if anyone else had anything that they wanted to say before we bring the meeting to a close. I would just say to everyone, don't waste a moment and 
share the truth with your friends as Amen. much as you can. Amen. All right, well, uh, let's just, I just want to um, talk to our Heavenly Family just a little bit again as we close off. Heavenly Family, thank you for revealing the gospel to us. Thank you for revealing to us the principles of truth and for bringing us together to discuss all these various elements. Um, And yes, in all things, Heavenly Family, I just want to second what Carol was saying of not wasting a moment sharing the gospel, bringing to people what they need to hear. Heavenly Family, please help us to do this. Fill us with zeal for the salvation of souls. Help us to be wise as servants and harmless as God. Help us to cooperate with you each moment for the sake of your kingdom. Thank you so much. Please bless us all now, Heavenly Family, as we rest. Help us to um, dwell on heavenly things. And thank you so much for this Sabbath. To thy Elohim. We ask these things to send Amen. Amen. Amen.